Laudator Jesus Christus, praise be Jesus Christ. This is Matt Gaspers, Managing Editor of Catholic Family News, and I'm joined as always by my friend and colleague, Dr. Brian McCall, who is the Editor-in-Chief of CFN. Hello, Brian. I hope you're doing well this uh, Friday in Passion Week. I am. I can't believe we're a week from the Triduum. This, this Lent has gone by quickly. It has. This whole year seems to yes. be slipping by very quickly. Yes. Um, Several stories to discuss today, uh, mostly in the realm of the church. So our topics are going to include Pope Francis's recent comment that our Lord gave us Mary, quote, as a mother, not as a goddess, not as a co-redeemer. So he seems to be going after her title of co-redemptrix again, sadly. And all the worse uh, as it falls near the Feast of the Annunciation, which that mm. feast is very much a part of her title. Uh, we're also going to be discussing the open rebellion against the Vatican's recent no to blessing same-sex unions. There's mm -hmm. lots of uh, firestorm going on in that regard. Uh, also, an, so a good story, uh, an encouraging story from Ireland, a priest there who is really keeping the zeal of St. Patrick yes. alive in that, in that once Catholic nation that is largely, sadly, apostatized from the faith. Mm -hmm. Um, also, a new interview of SSPX Superior General Father David Pagliarani, and it's very much focused on the pontificate of Francis and, and Francis's penchant for situation ethics. We'll get into all the details. And then lastly, a new meditation written by His Excellency Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano in preparation for Easter, which His Excellency graciously wrote in uh, response to a request from us here at CFN. Yes. We wanted to get his uh, thoughts on this very unique last year or so in church history and and uh, remind ourselves that, you know, all is not lost, that there is hope. The yes. hope of the resurrection is coming still. So before we get into all the news today, we'll take a brief look, as we always do, at the church's liturgical calendar and, and ponder for a few moments the things that are above, the spiritual things to keep us grounded in yes. uh, the faith. So today is Friday, March 26th, 2021, and as I mentioned a moment ago, it is Friday in Passion Week, and this day on the traditional Roman calendar is devoted to Our Lady of Sorrows. I believe the same mass propers are used as the ones on the Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows, September 15th. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if Brian has anything he wanted to add to that. Yes, it, it's uh, a... a a way really, and it fits in with our story, in addition to the Annunciation, this also honors the role of Our, our Lady as co-redemptrix because she she joined in the redemption, one, by consenting to the Annunciation, and then two, by uh, participating from the side of the cross as Our Lady of Sorrows at the crucifixion. At these two points is really theologically where co-redemption comes from. And, yes. and actually, as a result of this importance of this feast, uh, Father Peglirani, who we mentioned, has, uh, at last year, I think it was, had declared this a first-class feast in the houses of the traditional order of the Society of St. Pius X to honor it even more fittingly, because he said, in our times, we need to turn to Our Lady of Sorrows even more. Yes. So. Yes, and it's actually, it's been roughly a year since things really started ramping up in our country with yes. all of the coronavirus lockdowns, yes. restrictions, the closing of churches. I was, earlier today, I was looking at my uh, notes from our show from around a year ago, and that's when all of this was really starting to pick up steam. Yes. Um, so since our last, since our show last week on the Feast of St. Joseph, uh, some other saints and feasts commemorated since then include the great St. Benedict on March 21st. His feast fell on a Sunday this year, but uh, the great father of Western monasticism, certainly one of the most important saints for wow. Western civilization, yes. not just for the church, but for Western civilization in general. Uh, and then also the Feast of St. Gabriel on the old calendar, he has his own feast day, whereas in the new calendar, he's lumped together with, uh, with yes. Michael and Raphael on, what is it, September 29th, which is traditionally the feast devoted specifically to St. Michael. Yes. So it's nice that St. Gabriel, the messenger, gets his own feast day on the old calendar. 
And then most importantly, of course, uh, yesterday we celebrated the great feast of the Annunciation when the word was made flesh. Oftentimes we think when we think of the incarnation, our, our minds kind of turn to Christmas when, at his birth, but it was actually uh, the feast of the Annunciation when Our Lady consented to yes. God's plan that the word was made flesh in her womb. So we're gonna, that's going to be yes. the, the theme of our first story. And Brian, I think, had something he wanted to mention there. Yeah, and this is based on a beautiful sermon I heard yesterday. Because in addition to being the Annunciation yesterday, uh, it also was the 30th anniversary of the death of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, yeah. uh, who died on the Feast of the Annunciation in 1991, which that year actually also fell in Holy Week, um, which added an even more interesting note. But yes. what's, what's really appropriate about, again, nothing happens by chance uh, with God that he allowed and called for the archbishop's death on this day is in addition to all the aspects of Our Lady that we meditate on in the Annunciation, as Matt pointed to, it is the moment of the incarnation and it is the moment when uh, the second person of the Blessed Trinity became the priest, the high priest, as the mediator between God and man, right? Because how that we are utterly separate from God. We cannot reach God of our own natural ability, but because the second person of the Blessed Trinity became man, and he was both God and man, he becomes mm -hmm. the bridge as that priest. So that's what priests are. They are those who connect us to God. And at the moment of the incarnation, when he assumes the human nature, is when he forms this bridge between us. Mm -hmm. And it is really a celebration of the priesthood in addition to all the other aspects of the feast. Mm -hmm. And therefore it's very appropriate that you know, Archbishop Lefebvre who, who saved the Catholic priesthood from uh, being destroyed uh, by preserving the mass, preserving the sacrificial priesthood on, would, would be allowed to die on this day when the when yes. the priesthood was established uh, and, again, and it's also i think it's in church history it's also very common for saintly souls to die on a special feast day yes it's often a sign of election that our, our god grants uh, but really very very appropriate on this day uh, which really is a feast of the establishment when our lord jesus christ becomes the great high priest that mm -hmm. the the future priests of the catholic church uh, stand in the place of as an as an altar uh, yes. Christus. And it's also Catholic tradition holds, again, to link all of this, that it was also on this day, March 25th, when the, the crucifixion occurred. Again, the, the Good Friday and Easter are movable feasts because the Jewish mm. calendar had Passover keyed off of the movements of the moon, the moon lunar cycle. But in that year, tradition has always held that it was on the same day as the incarnation, which again, oh, wow. as the Annunciation, it shows this connection between Our Lady giving her consent, the Word being made flesh, and the the great offering of the, the great high priest, as well yes. as just a last quick reminder, that beautiful prophecy of uh, our, um, our Lady uh, 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 Good Success in Quito, yes. which uh, Archbishop Lefebvre didn't even know about. Somebody apparently showed it to him shortly before he performed the Episcopal consecrations in 1980. And he made reference to he, it in his sermon, right? Yes, he made reference yeah. to it, to part of that that Our Lady told uh, uh, the visionary there that in the 20th century, there would arise a prelate yes. who would preserve the Catholic priesthood. And again, he, Archbishop said, I'm not saying I'm not prelate, but I find it extraordinary that as we're doing this, preserving the Catholic priesthood, that, that I was became aware of this prophecy. Yes. So very, very important day in, in salvation history and in our, our times. Um, and a good day, a good time to pray. And particularly as we go into this Holy Week, into Monday, Thursday, to pray for priests. Absolutely. It's wonderful meditation. Thank you yes. for that. Um, before we jump into our first story, I did want to briefly mention, uh, as many viewers probably aware, there was a terrible tragedy in my home state of Colorado earlier this week. Uh, a young man, I think 20 or 21 years old, just went on a, a rampage uh, in a local King Supers um, supermarket, killing 10 individuals, sadly. And one of those people who were who was killed, I think maybe one of the first to be killed, was a police officer named uh, Eric Talley, who also happened to be a traditional Catholic. Uh, you know, very solid, very known for his very solid faith. Uh, he was only 51 years old. He married with seven children. And uh, so I'm happy to report that the Archdiocese of Denver uh, is going to be honoring him publicly with a solemn high mass uh, at the cathedral in Denver. And this is what Archbishop Samuel Aquila 
uh, released a statement earlier this week after the shooting. He said, I am deeply saddened by the tragic and sudden deaths of 10 people yesterday afternoon. This happened on uh, March 22nd in the shooting at a King Supers in Boulder. I have been praying for all those impacted by this senseless act of violence, and I want to express my spiritual closeness to them. And he goes on to say, uh, along with the rest of the community, we are waiting for more details. We do know that Officer Eric Talley was Catholic, one of the ones killed, and has been described as a man of character and strong faith, a loving father to seven children, a husband who cared deeply for his family, and a soldier of Christ. And he says, my prayers and those of the faithful of the Archdiocese of Denver are with the Talley family and all who have died. And it was reported by Catholic News Agency that, as I said, a solemn high mass will be offered on Monday next week, so Monday of Holy Week at the cathedral, which is a very a beautiful gesture to the, the family, especially. And I know Mr. Talley, how I found out about it was um, he apparently was a, he and his family attended the, the SSPX church in, um, in Watkins, St. Isidore's, in addition to attending other traditional Latin masses around Mm -hmm. But uh, that's how I found out about it through a, through an email chain. So, so we uh, please keep um, Officer Tally in your prayers for the the repose of his soul and also for the welfare of his family. And I know there are a couple different places where you, if you feel inclined, you can donate to help us to the support of his family. I can inc I'll include a link to that in the show notes for today. Mm. All right, so. Getting into our first story today, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, Pope Francis sadly has disparaged the Marian title co-redemptrix yet again. And before we get into what he said, I want to just briefly cover from, uh, this is one of the most, the earliest and most important writings that really point to Our Lady as co-redemptrix. It's from the second century uh, work Against Heresies by St. Irenaeus of Lyon, the Bishop of Lyon. And just to give you an idea of his connect, his very close connection to the apostles themselves, uh, Irenaeus was a disciple of another bishop named St. Polycarp from Smyrna in Asia Minor. Polycarp himself was a disciple of St. John the Apostle. So we're talking about two generations removed from the apostles themselves. And this is what St. Irenaeus writes concerning Our Lady. In accordance with this design, says St. Irenaeus, Mary the Virgin is found obedient, saying, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it un done unto me according to thy word. So obviously we're talking about the, um, the Annunciation, the feast we just celebrated yesterday. So he's, he's explaining how Mary is the new Eve, and that's really the root of this doctrine of her as co-redemptrix. So he continues, but Eve was disobedient, for she did not obey when as yet uh, she was a virgin. And even as she having indeed a husband, Adam, but being nevertheless a virgin, uh, inasmuch as they having been created a short time previously had no understanding of the procreation of children, he goes on to say, um, let's see here, wherefore, so getting towards the end of this passage, he says, and thus also it was that the knot of Eve's disobedience was loosed by the obedience of Mary. So just as Eve had a part in the fall of the human race, Our Lady had a role in the redemption of the human race, cooperating with her son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And he ends by saying, for what the virgin Eve had bound fast through unbelief, this did the Virgin Mary set free or loose through faith. So this is really the, the theological basis for the title co-redemptrix. So now getting back to what Pope Francis recently stated, this was during his uh, Wednesday audience this week, March 24th. He said, quote, Christ is the mediator. Christ is the bridge that we cross to turn to the Father. He is the only redeemer. There are no co-redeemers with Christ. He is the only one. He is the meteor, mediator par excellence. And I find this, so he's emphasizing the, the, the uniqueness of Christ, which I find very ironic considering his notorious <laughs> religious <laughs> indifferentism. I don't remember him mentioning any of this when he was in Abu Dhabi or when he was right. in Iraq recently. When he was saying basically everybody can get to God their own way, right? Exactly. So, so <laughs> exactly. And even as he says in Fratelli Tutti, you know, for yes. others drink from their own sources. For us, it's Jesus, but for right. others, it can be Buddha or Muhammad or whatever. 
So right. So they're, ironic. they're mediators, but our lady isn't. Right. right exactly. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, so he goes on to say, and this is really the crux of the, the matter. Jesus extended Mary's maternity to the entire church when he entrusted her to his beloved disciples shortly before dying on the cross. From that moment on, we have all been gathered under her mantle as depicted in certain medieval frescoes or paintings. Uh, but then he goes on to say, he essentially, he gave her to us like a mother, quote, uh, to whom Jesus entrusted to us, all of us, but as a mother, not as a goddess, not as a co-redeemer, as mother. Mm -hmm. And he further says, we need to be careful. The things that, that the church, the saints say about her, beautiful things about Mary, subtract nothing from Christ's soul redemption. He is the only redeemer. So the problem is that there, there's no contradiction. I mean, there's apparently one in his own mind, but theologically there is no contradiction between Our Lady as co-redemptrix and Christ as the, the unique redeemer. Yes. And again, it's there's several things ironic about that. You know, she is not a goddess, which is a true statement, but he brings a goddess, the Pacamama, into St. Peter's and performs, you know, and into the Vatican and allows right. it to be worshipped. So he's so worried about... Uh, you know, oh, people might be, you know, exaggerating their devotion to Our Lady when he's exaggerating and directing people to false pantheistic worship of a pagan idol, right? right. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's what's extraordinary about this, uh, th this statement. And really the origin of this is the Second Vatican Council, because this doctrine, which had been universally, ordinarily understood throughout, as Matt said, throughout the whole history of the church, there was a big movement towards defining it dogmatically in an extraordinary yes. way at the Second Vatican Council, which was completely gotten rid of. Why? Because they said it would offend Protestants. Mm -hmm. And so they opted instead, and they wax lyrical about how beautiful this title is, but they, they opted instead to just define her as the mother of the church, which again, she is. She is the mother of the church. But why do they prefer that and why do they hate these other titles? Well, because that title, as they said, is acceptable to Protestants. Why? Because it seems symbolic. It has a direct access in, in the scriptures because they say, oh, look, you believe in the Bible. Look at the Bible. It says, behold your mother. And so to Protestants, it's not as offensive to say, oh, well, we treat Mary as our mother in a symbolic way because of what, what Christ says in the scripture. But these other titles, which are come out of Catholic tradition, right, which are based in scripture, but not explicit. Right. They are offensive to Protestants. And so the council said, oh, get rid of those. And so again, once again, Francis is just a, a, a devoted, consistent son of the council who refused to acknowledge these titles. And now he's trying to ban them. He's trying to get rid of them and, yes. and mock them. And just to be clear, uh, LifeSite in their reporting on this added a section in their article. I'll, I'll include a link in the show notes. Hmm. Uh, but it's called "What Is Co-Redemption," and they provide a good summary of uh, of the of previous um, uses of the term co-redemptrix throughout church history. And they say in the article, in addition to numerous other non-canonized scholars, the Holy Office has weighed in on the issue, writing in 1908 in response to a query about the Feast of the Seven Sorrows of Mary that quote. The devotion of the sorrowful mother may increase and the piety of the faithful and their gratitude toward the, toward the merciful co-redemptrix of the human race may intensify. Yes. So the Holy Office has used the term. Uh, they go on to explain Pope Pius the, the 11th has used the term as well as Popes Pius the 9th, Louis, or Leo, excuse Leo. me, the 13th. St. Pius X and Benedict XV. So it's very, it's a very well-established Catholic doctrine. It's not dogma. It, not, it has not been solemnly defined, but it is clearly the common teaching of the church. Yes. So for him to be making these disparaging comments, he's in direct contradiction to his predecessors. And an interesting note about this too, because this is, as Matt has said, not the first time the Pope has done this. He disparaged Our Lady back on um, uh, December 12th, 2019, uh, and uh, that outburst is really what brought forth from Archbishop Vigano a beginning of his interventions on the Second Vatican Council. Because as yes. our readers remember, he denounced the, the corruption in the church in August 2018 in the McCarrick affair. But then he kind of went quiet. It went into a period that he said of study and reflection. And it was this 
uh, statement of the Pope, again, disparaging these titles of Our Lady, these, these privileges, really not just titles, but privileges, um, that brought forth a letter where he started making connections back, as I talked about, to the Second Vatican Council. And then it really started that process that culminated in June of 2020, six months later, when he came out with his more detailed assessment of the council. Yes. So during to wrap up the story, just during Holy Week, let's all remember to have particular devotion to Our Lady and her seven sorrows and, and be thankful to her for all that she did suffer in union with our Lord yes. to save our souls. Yes. Very true. Well, uh, our second story in terms of rebellion, again, the Pope here rebelling against the privileges of our, our Blessed Mother, uh, we have another rebellion going on, uh, really with its epicenter in Germany. So as we reported last week, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith issued a responsum uh, to a dubium uh, about whether same-sex couples could be blessed. And really, no, nothing new here. <clears throat> they just reiterated, no, as we've told you before, can't. Well, as we reported last week, there was a big outburst already. There were about a thousand clerics and pastoral care people, caretakers, whatever that is, <laughs> who refused this and objected. Um, after our report, later than into this week, uh, according to several news outlets, including Catholic News Agency, now more than 200 theologians have uh, signed a statement criticizing the rejection of blessing for same-sex couples. Specifically in the German-speaking world, yes. Yes, yes. The uh, Rhine continues to flow into the Tiber. Eh? <laughs> yes, exactly. And then we had this week a pastoral, <clears throat> excuse me, pastoral letter <laughs> of Bishop Franz Josef Overbeck, also of Germany, uh, where he really goes, and again, this is a letter he's writing to his, his faith, his, his lady entrusted to his care, explaining to them how, like, that this whole basically dissenting from the, the teaching of the letter, the, the dubium. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's a German letter, it's kind of a rough translation, give you some of the ideas, but it really shows that the, the ideas of Pope Francis are very deep-seated in this bishop that, um, that, that bring this about. Um, because he says, uh, basically, first of all, you know, it's clear that just repeating previous magisterial prescriptions right, an evaluation of homosexuality on the basis of natural law is no longer understood and no longer accepted in the present. So in one full sweep, he basically says, ah, you can't just hand on what we received, i.e. tradition, you can't just repeat what we received before, and we just got to chuck out natural law. Uh, the, 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 so the basic two bases of morality is revelation, what we've received, and natural law, what we can know by reason. Right. He just says we have to throw them out. Why? Uh, because people don't accept them. Uh, this He develops this theme a little uh, further when he says the teaching of the church calls for a broader view of human sexuality. Right? <laughs> uh, and because he says that uh, people have been reacting and, and saying, you know, this is... Um, you know, we don't accept this. Um, and uh, he says that, you know, people don't accept the church's teaching anymore, so we have to change it. And again, here's this error that's been very critical in Pope Francis. The test of the truth of morality and, and teaching of the church is whether people accept it or not. Right. And this is, and again, it's a distortion of a truth about the census fidelity, the sort of sense of the faithful, mm -hmm. which is not, as Professor de Matei has explained, is not a proof of what is true, but it can be a sign of when something's wrong, right? So it's, again, an analogy. He doesn't use yes. this, but an analogy can be kind of like if you start getting a fever, if you start getting the chills, those things don't tell you what health is, but they're kind of signs like, oh, something's wrong, like yes. warning signs. That's what the sense, when the sense of the faithful go, whoa, this is weird. That's not telling you what's correct, but it's saying there's something wrong with this. Right. But they've it's distorted instinct, that. Yeah an instinct against something. But they've yeah. distorted this into, and Pope Francis says this all the time, John Paul II said it, the Vatican Council said it, Second Vatican Council, that the people, what people think and believe is inspiration of the Holy Ghost, which is false. The right. Holy Ghost has been given to the, the, the successors of the apostles and the Pope to teach, not of the laity to sort of say, oh, we're going to tell you what's right and what's right. wrong. And again, if you look at this, this guts entire morality. Because it's basically saying morality is whatever people will accept. 
So right now he's saying, oh, these people don't accept that, you know, homosexuality is intrinsically evil. So it's not. So if tomorrow people don't accept, you know, that murder and mass murder and and just the extermination of, uh, of certain populations is, you know, oh, we don't accept that that's wrong anymore. Well, then all of a sudden that becomes right. It makes it purely a function of what's popular is what's mm -hmm. right. Uh, and again, kind of, that's I guess dangerous. you could say it's appropriate that this is, is exploding during the so-called year of Amoris Laetitia that yes. we reported last week, because that's essentially what that document teaches is a form of situation ethics. Yes, exactly. And that's what this is. And it looks not to natural law, but instead, as he says, we have to have this broader view based on, quote, advances of learning of the last few decades in fields of science. And last but not least, the experience from everyday pastoral care. So again, we don't look to the divine law revealed in the scriptures and the natural law to know what's right or wrong. We look to experts, scientific right. experts, and our experience, what we experience. Well, these so are classic not- Classic modernism, right? Classic modernism. These are not reliable sources of truth, right? right. These are not. And, and again, this is what Pope Francis has said. We have to look to our lived experience to tell us what, what is true. Uh, now, he then throws in, I love this. They always try to do this. This is the most flagrant, just, just like a gratuitous thing thrown in. He blames this, quote, narrower view of homosexuality that says that these things are intrinsically evil as, quote, part of the breeding ground for the terrible history of abuse in our church. So again, they throw out this canard Oh, the reason priests are abusing people is because we don't accept homosexuality, <laughs> which is, again, the opposite, as Archbishop Vigano has argued. It's been yes. the opposite of that, that the abuse came when we started saying, ah, this stuff's not that bad. Go ahead, do it. And then all of a sudden, these floodgates of abuse, as Archbishop Vigano has argued in his interventions in the McCarrick affair. Um, again, false. This is not true that it's the opposite. It's been the relaxing of moral standards, not, not the insistence on them that has brought this about. And then he again, he cites the Second Vatican Council in this letter. Citing the council, he says, we therefore need a serious and deeply appreciative reassessment mm. of homosexuality in our church so that the many people with same-sex orientation can come to an overdue liberation from examples of suffering in the past and present. So again, this idea that because you are committing sins and we're calling them sins, you're suffering. Right. So so like we should let all the mass murderers out of prison because, you know, they're suffering because we're telling them they did something wrong. I mean, again, right. on his principle, that's what you should do. Right. That if yeah. you if you discriminate by saying, well, what you did was wrong, you are now harming people and have to stop. Ultimately, this is rooted in liberalism. Liberal, liberalism, as he, he shows in his letter, holds fundamentally you can do anything you want as long as you don't, quote, hurt other people to find very narrowly. So as long as everybody mm -hmm. consents to what you're doing to them, then you can do whatever you want. There's no objective standard. And this is what he says. He says, uh, quote, you want to honor the person as a whole person and not ignore his sexuality, which is inseparable from his identity, especially when people live their sexuality responsibly and with <laughs> absolute respect for the dignity of the other in relationships. So in other words, what they want to reduce it to is, okay, if you go around doing these intrinsically evil acts with people that consent, oh, that's fine, because they said it's okay. But you can't do it against their consent. That's all that's abuse. And again, this will lead to everything. Pedophilia will be acceptable as long as the child says, oh yeah, it's fine, go ahead. What they see is wrong is if you force yourself on them. And that's the only thing that's wrong, because that's consistent with liberalism. As long as the person consents, it's okay. So euthanasia, if they consent, it's okay. All of these things, uh, anything goes as long as you consent. This leads him to the conclusion that contrary to the CDF intervention, that they must bless people in a way that's not a wedding, but a blessing. Right? And again, this is the thing I think is highly insulting these people. Like, oh, we're valuing and loving what you're doing. It's wonderful. We respect it. Oh, but it's not a wedding. So you get a second class blessing. Again, I think it's not going to appease anybody. But he says, no. why should we do these blessings? Why? And this is the most heretical part of it. Because, quote, God is present in these relationships, which he calls beneficial. And again, this is not just uh, outrageous. It's blasphemous. This is yes. saying God is present in sin. 
which is a blasphemy. Yeah. Right? God is never present in sin. God forgives us our sin if we go to him and ask forgiveness, but he is not present in our sin. He is not part of our sin, and our sin is never beneficial. And never. this sin in particular is 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 of the most extreme gravity and depravity. I mean, I read something, uh, a Father Zulsdorf, I think is how you pronounce his name, Father Z. Yes, Father Z. Yes. And he, he dis was discussing this, and he brought up in St. Catherine of Siena's dialogues, uh, private revelations from God the Father, are, God actually brings up the sin of Sodom and says that it is so, I'm paraphrasing, it's so disgusting that the demons that inspire it won't even watch while it's being committed because right. they can recognize with their angelic intellect how disgusting it is. Right. So this sin is one that calls to heaven for vengeance. I mean, it is. And, she, and, he also, and God is not present in it. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Yes. It's an abomination, as the book of Leviticus says. I mean, if this bishop Overbeck it was there in the reign of Pius the Ninth or Pius the Tenth, Pius I mean, any pope before John the Twenty Third, he would be instantly removed from this from his being a bishop, and he would be. I mean, because this is outright heresy and blasphemy, yes. undisguised. Yes. So uh, a priest that I think we've mentioned before on the show, Father Gerald Murray, he's a, a regular guest on EWTN's Raymond mm -hmm. Arroyo. You know, the world over, he had a good uh, response to this that. In regard to another uh, bishop from uh, what is it? Antwerp, yes. I think um, yes, and it's so th I think we covered this a little bit last week. But this bishop, um, let me get his name real quick here. So Johann Bonny, and he s said things like, "I feel ashamed for my church," all in reference to the the C CDF's responsum. I mainly feel intellectual and moral incomprehension. Well then you certainly shouldn't be a bishop if you can't understand this most basic issue. Um, so Father Murray ultimately, you know, ends up his article saying, at the time of his installation as the bishop of Ant uh, Antwerp, he publicly swore the required oath of fidelity that includes the following, quote, I promise that in my words and actions, I shall always preserve communion with the Catholic Church. I shall hold fast to the deposit of faith in its entirety. And this applies as well to Bishop Overbeck, who would have sworn the same oath. I shall faithfully hand it on and explain it, and I shall avoid any teachings contrary to it. So help me God. So he's invoking God in this solemn oath. And Father Murray says, Bishop Bonney faces a decision if he is to remain true to God and the words he solemnly swore on the Bible recant his rejection of the church's teaching and faithfully proclaim that teaching within his diocese. If he cannot do that, he should immediately resign. And if he won't resign, the same thing with Bishop Overbeck, the Pope should remove him uh, immediately. Now, here's an interesting thing I came across, um, an interesting perspective from Sandro Magister, another one, a uh, Vatican insider that we've mentioned on this show before in a long time, uh, reporter in all things Vatican affairs. And he noted an interesting um, detail that I, that kind of escaped my attention in the first reading of the responsum. Usually at the end of these documents, it says something like, you know, the sec the prefect of the congregation met with the Pope on such and such a date and the Pope right. gave his approval and ordered its publication. Well, in the responsum, uh, this is what it, it's, it doesn't say exactly, doesn't use that traditional formula. This is what it says, quote, the sovereign pontiff Francis at the audience granted to the undersigned secretary of this congregation, so the second in command, uh -huh. was informed and gave his assent to the publication of the above mentioned responsum ad dubium with the annexed explanatory note. So what's significant about the change is that as Sandro Bagister observes in his article, which and I'll include a link here, he says, already in this formulation, there are clues that suggest a lesser involvement of Francis compared with the previous responsa of the same congregation. Uh, on previous occasions, says Magister, the Pope had pre preliminary given an audience not to the secretary, but to the cardinal prefect of the dicastery. Mm -hmm and not simply to be, quote, kept informed and give his consent to the publication, but for something more exacting, namely to approve, meaning to make the decision his own and to yes. order that it be published. Um, and that's so, consistent with signs that Francis is already distancing himself from, from this. Right. 
Yes. Right, as, as has been claimed by such uh, outlets as the notorious Jesuit magazine America and, yes. and apparently a Buenos Aires newspaper. Yes. Um, so it is interesting. That's an interesting detail that I kind of missed, and I'm glad that someone noted it because yes. uh, it calls into question whether or not Pope Francis is really truly supportive of this or not. It's kind of a way of playing both sides of the aisle, so to speak. Well, and we know he's not because he's violated this himself. I mean, we've seen images of him giving blessings to openly uh, uh, practicing couples. Right. As and then I, I've also heard reported in his, uh, so this came out last week as we reported, and then in his Sunday Angelus address, he made some kind of what could be code uh, yeah. code language disparaging remarks against the the, yes. the uh, responsum. So yes. it's Francis being Francis in a nutshell. Yes, yes. <laughs> but, but a little more positive a, story. <laughs> yes, moving on to a more positive story. Uh, as we approach Holy Week next week, as as viewers no doubt know, many areas around the world remain in some form of a lockdown due to COVID nineteen some form of restrictions, including at you know, local parishes and such. Um, so for the second year in a row, the Vatican will have restrictions on its attendance for Holy Week. This is what um, the Vatican State, the Holy See Press Office released a statement yesterday saying, due to the continuation of the health emergency, and we wonder how much of an emergency yes. it really is at this point, uh, the Holy Father will again celebrate the Holy Week rites at the altar of the Cathedra in St. Peter's Basilica in accordance with the following calendar, and then it lists all of the, the dates and times, with the participation of the cardinals, the superiors of the Secretary of State, the same ones who have locked down the, the Basilica and forbidden private masses, and a limited number of the faithful. So, <clears throat> despite and these restrictions are... Similar restrictions are in place all over the world, including in Ireland, the center of our next story. Uh, but despite restrictions currently in place in the, the nation of St. Patrick, one Irish priest is taking a stand, thanks be to God, and is continuing to offer public masses despite uh, being fined by the, the local police and even facing possible imprisonment for refusing to pay the fine. And I want to read just a few quotes uh, Brian has on the screen displayed a, a story from the Irish Times, and they, they did an interview with him, and he's got some excellent things to say. So, for example, he, he starts by saying, why should I pay a fine? Oh, I should give the name of the priest before I go on. This is Father P.J. Hughes, and he is the parish priest of Molaharan and uh, Lauduff, and, and he was fined uh, on March 18th last following a Sunday mass he celebrated on March 7th 500 euros and if he re he's refusing to pay it so he could face a jail sentence so this is what he says why should I pay a fine for believing in God and celebrating the sacrament no I won't pay any fine the last time that happened Cromwell was here after Queen Elizabeth introduced the penal laws and then Cromwell tried to force them down people's necks. Maybe Brian could explain that history a little bit, kind of summarize. I know you know a lot about English and Irish history. So, yes, I mean, for 400 years, the English tried to suppress Catholicism through uh, measures uh, not unlike this, through, first of all, fines for attending mass, saying mass, and then other even more severe, you know, death, death sentences. Uh, but the, the, you know, the Irish people and priests held out until the 1960s when they essentially started giving up the faith after Vatican II. Yes. Uh, but there was a long period and fines were a very important part used by, uh, by the English to try to eradicate the faith. So it's yes. ironic here that in now Ireland, Southern Ireland, the Republic is not under English control and are doing it to themselves. Exactly. Yes. So if, uh, this Father Hughes goes on, quote, I know the story of the faith. I know the church hasn't been in favor with the people, but at the same time, the bishop is not the church. Jesus Christ established the church. Mm. He is to be honored and worshiped, and that's what I'm doing, whether the bishops like it or not, or whether anyone else likes it or not. So we applaud Father Hughes for his stand in this, in this uh, situation. We need more priests like him. 
Yes, yes. And a related story uh, is uh, a bishop, uh, Bishop Thomas Gullickson, who you can yeah, see there, uh, who was until his recent retirement, uh, the nuncio uh, to the country of Switzerland. Uh, and uh, he, he was in the news a little while ago, maybe uh, maybe about four or five months ago, because he had come out with a, an intervention uh, saying that he had switched over to the um, um, old breviary, mm -hmm. the, uh, the old text of the divine office, and yes. how much more nourishing it was than the one created after the council. Uh, mm -hmm. So he had said that, I think it was about four or five months ago. Well, he has now come out and said that the old rite, the traditional Latin mass, quote, touches my heart in a way the Novus Ordo never did nor could. Uh, so that Bishop Gullickson, who after his retirement, chose to retire to South, Sioux Falls, South Dakota uh, in January. Um, and uh, he has turned to uh, celebrating exclusively the traditional Latin mass. And he does it uh, not only privately, but also uh, uh, in uh, St. Mary's Parish in Salem or anywhere else, basically, where people would, would like it. Uh, and then he posted on the, the 23rd of March uh, a call to encourage his brother bishops to take on the public celebration of the old rite. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, there is nothing like this experience of being carried by the church in the person of its ministers. Uh, and again, he calls upon all the bishops of the world to turn to the traditional mass. And he has this to say about celebrating low mass. He said, it has uh, po me positively, quote, enthralled. It draws me in. Uh, it touches my heart, as I said, in a way the Novus Ordo never could, uh, never did, or never could. Uh, and this is really an um, interesting development. Again, uh, it's a seed, but now we have three bishops in the past few years uh, who have announced that they have found the old mass and that it is their exclusive uh, use now. We have this Archbishop uh, Gullickson. We also have Archbishop Vigano, who announced last year that he, for several years now, has been saying only what he calls the Catholic Mass, which yes. is an interesting term. Uh, and then we also have Bishop Huander, also in Switzerland, who upon his retirement uh, said he was retiring to a house of the Society of St. Pius X to exclusively offer the traditional Mass. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, we also have received, you know, un, you know, unofficial reports that there are several other bishops around the world who are doing the same thing, but who don't want to mention it publicly. Uh, but we see we have Bishop Strickland, who again, not exclusively yet, but who has moved and learned the traditional mass and has spoken of how it is superior to the Novus Ordo. So, again, these are very encouraging, encouraging signs to have bishops yes. uh, moving and saying these things and calling on other bishops to, um, uh, to move to. Uh, the traditional mass exclusively. And so we should pray for a particular Father Hughes getting, I assume he's saying the new mass, but ho hopefully God will grant him, as he did to Archbishop Vigano for standing up for the truth, will grant the Father a further insight to see, well, if the bishops are wrong about suppressing mass altogether, maybe they were also wrong about imposing this Protestantized uh, form of mass that is not focused on the worship of God as you so clearly yes. see. So maybe God will use his stand here as a moment of grace uh, to bring some of these other things to his, his attention. Before we move on, I just wanted to mention this last quote from Archbishop uh, Gullickson. He says, the Lord has convinced me that we won't need another generation to be able to see and rejoice in the church's consolation through the restoration of the sacred liturgy in all its glory. So yes. that's also another encouraging quote from, from Archbishop Gullickson. Yes. And, we've, and we know from all over the world, I mean, as we're going to discuss probably in our next story somewhat, that um, the only places really where the church is thriving is where tradition is being honored in, you know, various degrees. Yes. And the more it's being honored, the more the faith is thriving, the more souls are coming there. We have actually, a, I meant to, to mention in our forthcoming April edition of the paper, we have a very... Uh, detailed report about the growth of tradition in Florida by one of our contributors, and it's, it's a very encouraging article. The, yes. the attendance at traditional masses are around the country and around the world is exploding since the coronavirus lockdowns. Yes, very true. So the story Matt refers to is there was a written interview released uh, by the Superior General of the Society of St. Pius X, Father David Pagliarani, uh, who uh, is succeeded, uh, Arch, uh, it's not Arch, Bishop 
Bernard Fele as a superior general at the most recent elections. And um, it, it's interesting. This is one of the things I predicted at the time. People said, well, will he be different? And again, I think on the, the principal level, not at all, very similar. But on the personal level, he definitely seems to have a different personality, where, Archbishop, where Bishop Fele is much more uh, comfortable speaking with people and sort of live interviews and on in video. Uh, Father Pagliarani seems a more... Uh, uh, I don't know, I say not shy is not the right word, but a more, more reserved, private, maybe. more reserved. And so most of his interviews, he's done one, I think, video. Most of them are released written statements, you know, written interviews, uh, which mm -hmm. seems to be more his style. I mean, he did announce that his focus was going to be much more internal on protecting the priests and helping the working towards the sanctity of the priests and seminary. And so a more kind of introspective where Bishop Fillet was, again, personality-wise, much more extroverted in a certain way. But it's a beautiful interview. Again, it's it's hard because in our modern times, people are often engaged a little more by video, uh, which is sad, but it's a beautiful, beautiful text. And it really focuses on trying to understand the pontificate of Francis. And uh, the key to understanding comes in really the first question, where the interviewer says, well, is, is the way to understand Francis that he has a disconnect between pragmatism and ideas, action and ideas? So he kind of doesn't, you know, attack the ideas of the faith. He just sort of ignores them and wants to do things practically. And Father Paglirani says, no, that actually is not the way to understand him. And here I'll read from his response, part of his response. I'm not really sure that actions and ideas should be opposed in this way, the way the reporter uh, did. Pope Francis is definitely very pragmatic, but being a man of government, he knows perfectly well where he is going. A large scale action is always inspired by theoretical principles, by a set of ideas often dominated by a central idea to which all practice can and must be related. Po and, and, and here's where it's important. He says, it's not just like Francis just doing these things no, because he's disconnected from ideas. He has a very clear set of principles, ideology that is a core central belief. And we talked about in that prior story, right? The idea that absolute truth doesn't exist, doctrine doesn't exist, you just adapt it to what people believe. And he is actually implementing those ideas in the way he acts. So they're not just random actions that are disconnected. He wants to change ideas through praxis by changing the way we act. Mm -hmm. And uh, he goes on to say that Pope Francis does have kind of a stigmatic system, but it's one that is so off the charts, to use my terms, that that's why people have a hard time understanding it, because they try to put him in a box. Oh, is he liberation theology? Is he this? And he really isn't. As Father Pagliarani says, Pope Francis is beyond this system, even any beyond known system, any yeah. known system. <laughs> I believe that the ideas that direct his actions cannot be analyzed and interpreted in a satisfactory way. If we limit ourselves to traditional theological criteria, he is not only beyond any known system, he is above them all. Um, now, this is really interesting because what he's saying is like John Paul II, they were all more categorized. You say, well, he was a, a personalist. He believed in, you know, this sort of strange experientialism, um, uh, phenomenology, and, and they sort of could be pigeonholed. But what he mm -hmm. sort of says is what the Second Vatican Council do is by opening things up, it prepared the way for someone to transcend even these categories and to adopt something that's even sort of beyond them, right? And as Father observes, even under John Paul II and Benedict XVI, he says certain points of Catholic doctrine remained untouched. Yes. And specifically with Benedict, he says we were dealing with a spirit that was attached to the roots of the church his considerable effort to square the circle by reconciling tradition with conciliar or post-conciliar teaching, though doomed to failure, nevertheless revealed a concern, at least, for fidelity to tradition. But with Francis, that's all out the window. Exactly. And then he summarizes what is this new system that transcends. And he again, really just goes back to that story about the letter of Bishop Overbeck, he, 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 because it's exactly that principle. He says, Father Pagliarani says, it seems to me uh, the system of Francis to be affected by a kind of hyper realism, a sort of pastoral hyper realism. According to him, i.e. Francis, the church must face the facts. It is impossible for it to continue to preach moral doctrine as it has now done up until now. She must therefore resolve to capitulate to the demands of modern man and consequently to rethink her role 
as a mother. And this is crucial right here. Yes, yes, right here. This is exactly. And this on this principle, what our Lord should have done in John 6, when the people said, this is a hard saying, we can't accept it. He should have said, ah, OK, uh, well, forget about that. Yeah, you won't accept it. So I changed my mind. Uh, I'm right. not going to you don't have to eat my uh, eat my flesh and drink my blood. I mean, this is exactly essentially what he says. And in this sense, I, I think he very much correlates Father Pagliarani with Archbishop Vigano, that Pope Francis is rooted in the Second Vatican Council, but he's sort of taken it to new levels. He is so he is connect in continuity with it, but even in sort of a hyper continuity that he's brought it to its logical conclusions. And mm -hmm. here's what he says, Father Pagliarani. There is both a continuity with the premises laid down at the council and a superseding of them. Mm -hmm. Now, this means the church must adapt to the sins of the world. So what he explains is the council said we must adapt to the situation of the world, adapt our giramento, come to terms with the world. And now he says what France has done is that elevated it to a new level, not just to the situation of the world, like find people where they are and try to bring them to the truth, but now it's adapt to their sins and whatever right. they're sinning. Now we make that moral. And again, that's really what he's putting his, his, his uh, finger. I love on. his analogy about the, the, you know, the church is our spiritual mother. And he says, instead of, according to Francis, instead of being a mother by transmitting her life and educating her sons, yes. in other words, exercising authority over them, she will be one in as she will be one in as far as she knows how to listen, understand, and accompany her sons. So yes. the church needs to become completely passive. Yes. And he brings in the final conclusion, which is the conclusion of all people like Francis, uh, that Francis is a utopian. The essentially, it's the irony. By saying he's so hyper-realist, he's so focused on reality, he actually becomes disconnected from reality because he wants to create an ideal that is so disconnected from the truth. And, and Father Pagliarani says- I.e. E. the Abu Dhabi Declaration. <laughs> yes. He says- this is what is called a utopia, Pope Francis's system. And this is what happens to all those who cut themselves off from their roots. The Holy Father breaking with divine tradition, that's a strong statement, he has broken with divine tradition, aspires to an ideal and an abstract perfection, totally disconnected from reality. And this is what all the church has always taught against utopians. They claim they want to make the world better. They want to fix reality, but they're actually so focused on reality and, and creating uh, this new reality that they've totally lost the thread, to use an analogy Archbishop Vigano uses, and they're totally lost in their own abstractions. Now, this is what St. Thomas More yeah. mocked in his, his satire book, Utopia. That is exactly what he was satirizing this this trend of uh, you to all utopians. And again, very strong statement. Francis has broken with divine tradition. And if I remember correctly, this is this theme of uh, utopia, utopian society, was really present in the pontificate of Paul the Sixth as well as yes. John Paul the Second, both of whom talked about something called a new civilization of love. Isn't that I remember John reporting on that yes. a lot in years past. Yes, the civilization of love, and frankly, even the culture of life was a phrase that was a bit, bit confusing and, and sort of rung true of this. Again, even though Pope John Paul II used it to fight abortion, it was, again, a bit in, a, in these t terms, the civilization of love, culture of, are, are all these sort of disconnected from reality uh, visions. Right. But again, commend the whole interview to you. He winds it up by saying, what is the solution to Francis? And it is the same solution proposed by all the preconciliar popes, a return to honoring Christ the King. That that is the only, and that is exactly what Archbishop Vigano has said. It is a right. return to Christ the King is the and only And which way is really what the message that Archbishop Lefebvre devoted much of his teaching to over the years, was it not the, the yes. necessity of returning to Christ the King? Yes, uh, very much so. And again, re recommend the book. We have un they have uncrowned him from Archbishop Lefebvre that that deals with this topic most directly. Yes. So speaking of Archbishop uh, Vigano, our last story today, and I know we're getting short yes. on time, so we won't spend yep. too long on it. But uh, it's available on our website, as Brian has displayed. Archbishop Vigano, as I mentioned in the introduction, graciously uh, responded to a request from us to write an, an meditation in preparation for Easter. Uh, which he has done, and the he titled it, uh, quoting from Psalm uh, 129, you know, the English translation, if, if, lo if you, O Lord, observe or count our iniquities, Lord, who can stand? Uh, and then he also quotes from the, the Easter 
uh, sequence of death and life have contended in the conflict stupendous. Mm. So let's give a little uh, flavor of it and encourage you to read it on our website. He opens by saying, last year with a decision as incomprehensible as it was wretched for the first time in the Christian era, the Catholic hierarchy placed limitations on the celebration of Easter following the mainstream narrative narration of the pandemic. Uh, one year later, nothing has changed with respect to them, very, and it's very true in most places. And we hear it repeated once again that we ought to prepare ourselves for further lockdown in order to allow the population to be subjected to an experimental genetic serum, referring to the vaccine, imposed by the pharmaceutical lobby despite their not knowing what long-term side effects there may be. And he goes on to say, as Catholics, we are called to understand the scope of how much for more than a year all of humanity has been forced to undergo in the name of an emergency that has caused a number of deaths that is no different from preceding years. We are called to understand even before believing, because if the Lord has endowed us with intelligence, he does so in order for us to use it to recognize and judge the reality which surrounds us. And he goes on to say later, if this pseudo pandemic is a scourge, it is not difficult to understand what the sins are for which heaven is punishing us. Crimes, abortions, murders, homicides, divorces, violence, perversions, speaking of the sin of Sodom, vices, thefts, deceptions, betrayals, etc., etc. Both public sins as well as the sins of individuals the sins of God's enemies, as well as the sins of his friends. That reminds me of what Benedict the 16th said in 2010, when asked about the third secret of Fatima, and specifically if, if it has relation to the sexual abuse of minors. And he famously talked about the passion of the church and that the worst uh, persecution of the church comes from sin within the church. Uh, so Archbishop Vigano says the sins of lay people and the sins of the clergy, of the lowly as well as the leaders. So he's really putting this in a supernatural context that it, you know, even though most likely the the um, Wuhan virus escaped from a lab or was e either escaped or was deliberately released on mankind by the Chinese Communist Party, it is obviously also being used by God as a scourge, as a chastisement uh, for sin. But ultimately, he, as he always does, he brings us back to, you know, finding the hope in the situation, the silver mm -hmm. lining. He says, without repenting of our sins, without the intention of amending our life and conforming it to the will of God, uh, in contrast to adapt, you know, the church adapting to the sins of the world. No, we need to conform ourselves to God and his will. Mm -hmm. We cannot hope that the consequences of our sins, which have offended the divine majesty, and can be appeased only by penance will disappear. So in other words, you know, getting our people submitting themselves to the vaccine and all the lockdowns and stuff, ultimately that's not going to get rid of the problem yes. because that's not what brought on the problem. Uh, and a lack of vaccines or whatever is not what brought on the problem. Ultimately it is a problem of sin. Yes. And he, he goes on to say, our Lord has shown us the royal way of the cross. Let us each take up our cross, denying ourselves and following the divine master. Let us draw near to Holy Easter with the knowledge that we are always beneath the gaze of the Lord. And let us remember that on the Dies Irae, the, the day of wrath, we will all certainly have him as our judge. But thanks to baptism, we have merited the right to recognize him as brother and friend. I don't know if Brian so it's to a, add anything else. Yeah, it's a beautiful meditation, and we thank uh, His Grace uh, for sending it to us at our request and, and commend it to you for your reading in Holy Week. Uh, sort of brief footnotes to the story. Uh, in addition, there's sort of a follow-up that we just posted this morning of a real pastoral letter <laughs> issued by yes. Bishop, uh, on the vaccine and uh, goes into many of the themes that Matt mentioned in the meditation. Uh, he goes into more detail here uh, on the um, uh, the va on the vaccine. And what he really highlights is something we've been talking about a lot. <laughs> several people and several good bishops, we commend them for them, uh, have highlighted the moral problems with the 
uh, vaccines that are made from abortion and have highlighted the complex moral issues there. We've talked about that. But really, the problem with these vaccines transcends that. It's it, That's not the only problem, right? If that were the only problem, that would be the only analysis. And what he focuses on is not the abortion aspect, which he's spoken to before, but that it is utterly imprudent to take these vaccines. And he goes through huge conflicts of interest, the dangers of the vaccine. And again, he's calling the vaccine is not even accurate. They are, as he says, experimental gene serums. They're not right. traditional vaccines. Uh, and so again, really a lot more detail he goes into here about how we can't trust what they're telling us about them uh, and how it's, it's really not about our health or helping us be uh, more uh, over an illness, uh, really, really important letter, pastoral letter on this, which is very clear thinking. So recommend that also on our website after you read the, the meditation. And then another footnote, just want to mention, we've mentioned this before, uh, this week published by Angelico Press is a mm -hmm. definitive anthology of the interventions of Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano on Church, America, and the World, uh, of called A Voice in the Wilderness. And it collects his significant interventions from August 2018 to January 2021. Um, again, it had to stop at some point because he keeps right. issuing them, but uh, it collects them all, includes and, and groups them into categories relating to uh, the, the sexual abuse crisis in the church, Vatican II, and the Great Reset, the Deep State, Deep Church, gives a, mm -hmm. a summary of what are in each of these sections, kind of what is his teaching, so it synthesizes in these different interventions, what is Archbishop Vigano's position on these, and that has extensive hundreds of footnotes explaining and giving explanations and, and mm -hmm. references for many of the things he, he does, so it's a, about, uh, oh, I forget now, 400 some pages with notes and index and everything, yes. um, that 442 pages, uh, is available for Angelico Press in both soft cover, uh, paperback, and hardcover, uh, really a, a beautiful collection, uh, the nourishing collection of the, the wisdom of Archbishop Vigano over the past uh, um, two and a half years. Yes. So recommend uh, taking, taking a look at that. And sometime soon, Brian and I will record a show devoted exclusively to this book and go through it and kind of summarize some things. I'd like to yes. pick Brian's brain a little bit. He had the honor of being involved in the putting together this book. So yes. we'll look forward to, to discussing yes. the book in, in, in detail. Great. Well, thank you for, for watching the show today. Please, as always, if you could uh, return to us by uh, liking it, subscribing to our channel on Rumble or YouTube, forwarding videos, forwarding links to them to anyone, forwarding our, our posts on our website of uh, Archbishop Vigano, for example, to all your contacts to help us reach more and more people, which is our, our goal. And then also, if you've enjoyed the free content, please consider subscribing uh, to our monthly periodical. The April issue will be out in just a few days next week uh, with, again, lots and lots of uh, new content, further developments of things we talk about in the, in the videos. Uh, from from great names uh, in the traditionalist movement like uh, Christopher Ferrara, Mary, yes. uh, Mariana Bartold, uh, and, and many, many others. So please consider, uh, we do put a kind of a list of the articles in there so you can see what would be in the next article when it publishes. One or two of them we may publish on the website as a promotion, but again, the 90% or 85, 90% of the content is in the subscription uh, to the paper. So please consider subscribing at catholicfamilynews.com. And then also to let you know, as next Friday, will be Good Friday to honor the solemnity and the solemnness of the day. We will not have a news broadcast next Friday as we should be all at the foot of the cross with our, with our lady. Uh, we yes. may earlier in the week, depending on scheduling, have a, a special report that we can put out next week, but uh, our, we will not have a news broadcast until after, after the sacred triduum. Yes. Well, until next time, we wish you all well, and we will end as we always do with uh, praying the Hail Mary and specifically honoring Our Lady as the co-redemptrix. Yes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Eternal Father, I offer to thee the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and all the instruments of his holy passion, that thou mayest put division in the camp of thy enemies. For as thy beloved Son hath said, a kingdom divided against itself shall fall. Our Lady of Sorrows, pray for us. Our Lady, co-redemptrix, mediatrix of all grace, and our advocate, pray, pray for, for us. us. Our Lady of Fatima. 
pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. We wish you a fruitful Holy Week. We, we hope that you have access to the traditional triduum wherever you are uh, and, and can benefit from that, notwithstanding the deep state and deep church trying to ban, ban the triduum mm -hmm. and ban the celebration of our, our Lord's triumph over the devil. We hope you have some access and uh, are able to get, get to it. If not, there are several sites, there are several places and traditional groups that are will be live streaming it if you are. Uh, caught in a place where it's it's been banned but we hope that, that the great mystery of our redemption benefits you and your family uh, immeasurably and that god grants to you those particular graces that he is longing to give you at this uh, easter 2021 yes god bless you and we'll see you next time